Welcome to a town hall webinar about COVID-19 and other topics featuring ASMP General Counsel Tom Madry, Copyright Attorney Michael Clipper, and ASMP Executive Director Tom Kennedy. Take it away, Tom. All right, thank you, Doug Pizak. Thank you, Stretch Ledford. Thank you, Jake Campos. And thank you, Nicholas Freeman, for all providing the technical support that makes these town halls possible. I wanna welcome everybody. It's hard to believe, but this is our eighth town hall meeting. And we continue to have a lot of material to discuss, both in terms of getting information about finding financial relief, but also, as you'll hear today, we're beginning to talk about what happens for all of our all of our industry as uh, governors make the decision and mayors and municipalities make the decision to open up aspects of business. So there's a lot to get to, and I want to start by talking with Mike Clipper, our Copyright Counsel, and Tom Madry, our General Counsel, about what we're doing on the advocacy front, because there's been some things in the background that we've been all working on together this week. So Mike, why don't you go ahead and get started with that? Okay, I think last week, we, Tom and I mentioned that we were looking at a letter from a number of similarly situated organizations focusing on issues of special concern to small businesses, particularly what we call micro-businesses depending on how you define it, folks under you know, um, five or 10 employees with other characteristics such as a set income level. Um, we spoke to people in the music and in the publishing and authors communities, and then we spoke with folks at the PPA who along with us are putting together a letter that would go to the leadership in the House and Senate, and probably to the leading committees too, Tom. I suspect it'll go to small business in both houses and the committees responsible for the CARES legislation, which would be finance and ways and means, some finance in the Senate and ways and means. The gist of the letter is to really put a focus on issues which to date, unfortunately, have not gotten a lot of attention. We've all seen lots of press about companies who are returning money, about money running out too soon, but unfortunately, far too little among the freelance, focusing on the freelance community, which is obviously our interest. The letter will have um, probably three or four points to be made, and hopefully will be signed by a bunch of groups of uh, not just us, but hopefully we could get, as I mentioned, authors and others in the graphic artists and visual artists communities, songwriters, et cetera. The gist of the letter will focus on three issues. Uh, one would be direct, some kind of direct payment or a specific line item set aside for businesses that qualify as micro businesses. Uh, the problem is the money isn't often going down to that level. And there's a concern that like cities like Charlotte, Chicago, New York, and Albuquerque have done among others, that they have set aside directly for either loans or grants to micro businesses. We'd like to see that built in. The other two issues that we're looking at, and Tom Madry will elaborate on this, is the question of making sure that trade associations such as ASMP can also qualify under the CARES Act for relevant, relevant provisions. And also talk, uh, we wanna focus on the difficulties that people have experienced on the state level and the need to better coordinate between the, the state and the federal provisions on unemployment that resulted from the CARES Act. Um, Tom, I, Madre, I don't know if you want to jump in on that or wait until I'm done. I just wanted to mention one other thing. Um, the CASE Act is also very much on our minds. And we have just yesterday launched a new salvo of letters to the Senate. As you all know, the small claims bill known as the CASE Act has passed the House overwhelmingly by voice vote in the Senate Judiciary Committee, and for several months since October, I guess, has been stuck before the, on the Senate, in the Senate, because Ron Wyden of Oregon has what we call a hold on it, which means a procedural move that, unless Mr. McConnell feels he has enough support, is going to mean the bill will not come up. So we've been negotiating to try to get that moved along, and to break the hole by widen those talks, unfortunately, I can't report as being very successful to date. They go back and forth. They have good moments and bad, and I think we're in a lull now. And we've decided because of that lull and because enough time has passed that the virus has been on the forefront, we stepped back for a while, that we are going to relaunch our 
campaign to get the bill taken up by the full Senate. In that regard, Tom Kennedy sent a letter yesterday to the, all the members of the Senate Judiciary Committee, I'm sorry, the Senate, probably about 75 or so, 80 in number, Tom, right. who are not yet co-sponsoring the bill, urging them to co-sponsor it and tying it for the, you know, in the letter to the fact that the Case Act was motivated by this inequity in the system that hurt you guys when you get ripped off and have so much difficulty in getting legal redress. But we link that in this letter to the current pandemic problems and the idea that we are fighting basically you know, two fronts now, as are so many others fighting with us on the pandemic front, but that the need for the legislation is shown to be even more necessary in light of the current situation as you are suffering as, you know, as, as a community. Um, so that letter did go out yesterday, Tom? Is that yeah, right? it went out and we're messaging to membership now urging uh, everyone to double their efforts and make contact with Senator Wyden either by phone or by email to let him know that we're uh, expecting him to lift this hold, that this has become an unconscionably protracted uh, sequence and it's just time for him to get out of the way and let this bill pass so that everybody can at long last have a mechanism to resolve infringement that's, that's other than federal court. And that seems to me to be an essential thing. And so I am gonna remain laser focused on that along with uh, efforts on the pandemic front that Tom's gonna to speak to now. Tom, do you wanna to refer to those two categories I mentioned on the unemployment and the 501c6? Sure, sure. Um, uh, you know, there are there are a couple issues that are lingering, and, and Tom mentioned uh, a number of them that he wrote in the letter, but 501c6s, which are trade associations, were nonprofit organizations, and in the CARES Act, there were uh, pretty much only 501c3s were, um, uh, were eligible for this type of stimulus relief. That's made it really hard for organizations that work on behalf of members and any kind of membership association groups that are nonprofits like we are um, to, to survive, frankly. Uh, and so that's something we're hoping we can very much be involved in in the next set of, uh, of stimulus, uh, if there is a, a next set of stimulus. The other thing, and, and the more important thing, is uh, things related to the pandemic unemployment assistance program and all the stuff that's going on uh, at the state level when it comes to unemployment and unemployment assistance. And at this time, I'll go ahead and, and introduce uh, Lindsay Best. Uh, Lindsay Best uh, is a photographer out of California who is actually on video here with us today. And uh, she's going to have a question about some unemployment issues. And we're just going to launch right into a question at the beginning before I start talking. Hi. Um, so I am a self-employed photographer based in Los Angeles. Um, a issue that myself, as well as a, a lot of other photographers who I've been chatting with, um, are having is that as self-employed people, we are being asked to report income when it is received instead of when the jobs were worked. So it's very common for us to have been, to be paid 30 to 90 or even longer days after a job is completed, which would essentially be meaning that we would be receiving checks from jobs in December, January, or February, or possibly even before then, um, which would essentially be disqualifying us from unemployment now based on jobs that had been completed months ago. Right. Right. You know, this is uh, when you submitted this question, um, my, my staff did a, a pretty deep dive into, uh, into this issue. And in my head, um, you know, it doesn't make sense that a job that you did months ago uh, that you receive money from should, should negatively impact your ability now to receive unemployment benefits because um, just based on how long your, uh, your client took to pay. That doesn't make any kind of intuitive sense. So I went and looked at both uh, what California uh, has to say about it and what some other states have to say about it. And uh, the news I'm going to give you is exactly what you would expect from a lawyer, which is I'm not entirely sure. And the reason is it comes down to language. Okay. 
um, there's a difference between wages and income. And so, for example, uh, I'm here in Dallas, Texas, and if you go to the Texas Workforce Commission, uh, when it talks about how you report each week, you report to the unemployment office what you made. But um, they talk about it as work is any type of service for pay, including or not limited to blah, 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 right? And if you're self-employed, then it talks about how you report that kind of income. But it's only you have to attest when you're reporting that, that you didn't make money in this week and you didn't make money in that week. Those are your unemployment weeks, right? Now, California is a little bit different. And so I kind of started looking into what California is saying, and it does say if I earn any wages. Now, this is a tricky, <laughs> this is tricky, and I wish I could boil this down into one sentence, but I would argue that you have not earned any wages during the time period that you have been unemployed. And if I had to make an argument to uh, someone at the unemployment office, I might say, well, you know what? There are people who are W-2 employees who are on commission. And maybe they sold the car six months ago and the dealership just got around to paying them now, but the dealership fired them five months ago, right? That wouldn't make intuitive sense that they would be penalized now. However, what we're seeing is that not only is every state using different language, sometimes it matters who you talk to at the state and what kind of arguments and appeals you make. And so my question to you, Lindsay, is after you got that information, did you appeal your benefit um, designation? Well, I actually did not put any, I did not certify because I didn't know how to answer the question. So I did yeah. not put anything through that had disqualified me. Um, I just was posing the question because it was a question that um, had come up yeah. when I was looking to certify. And it was a question that several other photographer friends of mine had also had. Yeah. Um, we were just, we were unsure of, it didn't seem like the intention of the law to disqualify us from in, from assistance now based on jobs that we had months ago, but the language and the question seemed to suggest that. So we were just yeah. confused. You know, when, when I think about what, when I read the language that's here in the California unemployment site and, and many others, it talks about any money that you earn, right? And that earn, if you earned it before your unemployment period started, that raises a big question if it's money that needs to be reported, okay? Now, I say that with the caveat that the state can kind of do whatever they want here. And if the examiner who's looking at it interprets it one way, there's not clear guidance that I could find about do you report it or do you not report it. My general rule is that you want to be very straightforward in the amount of money you're making. At the same time, um, you know, if you look at it from a tax perspective, you look at it from other perspectives, what you're describing is something that happens often, okay? So what we've done is my staff is uh, uh, getting on the phone with California, and we're going to uh, see if we can get someone actually to give us an answer that makes sense and is definitive. And I think if it's come up for you and your photographer friends, it's coming up for a lot of people in a lot of different states. And so we're going to be looking into that and seeing if we can get some clear answers on it. Because I've read hundreds of pages of stuff at the California Unemployment Office, and I don't think I can get a clear answer on that right now. Thank you. Yeah, another thing that made it extra confusing was that every other help page on the EDD website specifically says, even in bold letters, to report wages when they are worked and not when payment is received. The only... Yeah. Yeah, the only portion where it said that was in the question for self-employed people. So it was difficult to even navigate getting help on the actual EDD website. I totally agree. And see, they're, they're really making the distinction between W-2 workers and self-employed workers. And they're saying, well, W-2 can do it one way and self-employed have to do it a different way. But I go back to that example of someone who works on commission. It's not exactly the same, but essentially it's deferred payment for work already done back when you were employed. And I feel like that's a real strong argument um, into, you know, that, that this amount of money is not being earned 
uh, it's not work you're doing right now, you're still unemployed. Um, but you're right, this distinction with the self-employed versus W-2 workers is something that needs to be clarified. And we're gonna see if we can figure out how, how California is clarifying it and a couple of other states as well, because we did some investigation and couldn't find a clear answer across the board. It's a great well, question really though. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Lindsay, for popping on today. And that's going to start our discussion. We're going to get back into uh, PUA and unemployment uh, here in just a moment. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen so that we can knock through some of these things and get to some questions, okay? All right. One second. And I hope everyone can see that. Uh, Tom, can you give me a thumbs up if that's looking positive. All right, looking good. So we're going to talk about three topics today. Um, we're going to talk about loan forgiveness for the PPP program. This isn't something we've really spent much time on before because we've been so focused on getting people to apply and receive PPP money that we haven't talked about how if you get that paycheck protection loan, you know you can get it forgiven. So we're going to spend some time on that because there's actually one or two little tricky parts in there. We're going to talk about a question that we've been getting a lot of, and that's all of the things related to going back to work during this pandemic. And there's kind of two sides to this. There's the health and safety side, and there's the legal side. And there's going to be a lot more than we can talk about today, and that's why next Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern, I'll be doing a webinar on those issues health, safety, legal waivers. We're gonna get into the deep dive on what you need to have if you're going back and you're gonna be shooting now. And there's a couple different areas we want you to be aware of because look, if you're a photographer and you have an assistant come, well, you're now an employer and you have legal responsibilities uh, in relation to your employees, right? Or your contractors. Now, they're probably actually employees. We won't get into that too much, but you have legal considerations there. You also, there are some best practices that are out there. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about some of that today and deeply about that on Wednesday. And there'll be more information on that, uh, including a link to register coming up. And then we're gonna end up, um, uh, and wrap up with the 1099 W-2 mixed worker dilemma. This is where, you are being locked out of the pandemic un unemployment assistance program because you have even a minimal amount of W-2 income. About four weeks ago was the first time that I heard that someone was having this issue. It was actually out of Colorado. And we looked into it and we weren't sure if it was a Colorado thing. And now it is clear every week we're getting more and more questions. This is widespread. So I'm going to give you exactly what we've been doing, what the current status is, and we're going to get into it right now. Hold on a second. Why are you not working? There we go, okay. Like always, got a little disclaimer. If you go back and you were to watch the first four town halls, and remember this is our eighth and we're really happy that you're here. It's, uh, it's been uh, rewarding for, for Tom and myself and every week we get hundreds of people here and I hope we could get hundreds more because I hope this information is useful to everyone. But every week things are changing, right? And there's new guidance coming out and new issues that are coming up and different states are doing different things. And we're always gonna to try to get you the best information that we can. At the same time, you always want to check and double check, check with your advisors, check with your state. Uh, we're gonna do our very best, but we don't know every specific situation in all the states and all the banks and everything else. So um, stick with us, get the basic information, and then check and double check, it's really important. So a couple changes in the last week that I think are relevant. Last week, I said that I really doubted there would be any money in the PPP program this week. I am thrilled that I am wrong, okay? There is some money left in the Paycheck Protection Program, and you need to apply. And I'm not gonna go over applying today because we've done that a lot. You can go to ASMP.org, and you can see a lot of articles we wrote on how to apply, how to calculate things, you go to your bank or lender. I'm gonna list some of those again here in a second. But again, now, 
I might be wrong, but I'd be really surprised if one week from today there's any money left. And again, I hope I'm wrong. But the EIDL program, when it was allocated 60 billion more dollars about two weeks ago, has never opened up again to anyone until I think yesterday or the day before. And what they were saying is they were working on the backlog of applications. So you can't go and apply unless this is what the SBA has said. The SBA will begin accepting new EIDL and EIDL advance applications on a limited basis only to provide relief to U.S. agricultural businesses. So if you didn't get your um, your EIDL application in before, I think it was April 14th, and you're not an agricultural business, and I think very few of us on this uh, call are, then you're out of luck for an EIDL advance or an EIDL loan at this point. Again, this is the type of thing that I went and looked at this before this town hall just to make sure that uh, it was still where I thought it was, and it wasn't. This is something that's just come about. So your guess, I'm not going to opine uh, as to what kind of lobbying went on to get the U.S. agricultural groups uh, able to get this money and not all the other small businesses, but there it is. That's from the SBA. Remember, that's separate. The EIDL program is separate from the Paycheck Protection Program. Please apply for the PPP if you haven't already. Please apply. And you might say, where can I apply? Well, here's what I told you last week, and I still tell you this week. We have had such good reports from people who, in the span of 48 hours, have applied and been approved. This finally is working in a, in a way that, that seems to be quick. Now, is it working at the big banks that way? No. We're still getting, we're still getting reports that things are a mess at the bigger banks. But some of these places that aren't banks, they're lenders, these financial tech startups, um, those are places that we've been seeing good reports. Again, these are based on things I've heard from our membership and people who have reached out. Bluevine, PayPal, Lendio, Square, QuickBooks Capital, Cabbage. Those are places you can go and submit applications. And I know we have a few questions about applications today. We're gonna to touch on them. Um, we're gonna to try to keep updating posts with new information. No promises here, of course. Money can run out at any time. It may have run out in the last two hours and I didn't realize because I was writing this stuff, okay? But what I wanna start with today is loan forgiveness. Because remember, the Paycheck Protection Program is really great because if you use it for the reasons you say you're gonna use it, then the loan is forgiven in its entirety after eight weeks. That's wonderful. But then a lot of questions come in now that people are starting to get the PPP money. Well, what do I need to do to get this loan forgiven? So we're gonna talk about some of that for a second. First thing to note, the Small Business Administration and Treasury have told us already they are going to come out with new guidelines for loan forgiveness and the policies and procedures. So what I'm telling you now is what we know and what we are pretty confident we know there's gonna be new guidance on this. And when that occurs, of course, here on the town hall, we'll come out and, and let you know what that is. First thing, and maybe most important thing I want you to remember, you must apply for loan forgiveness. It is not automatic. And you have to apply with your bank or your lender where you got the loan from. You don't do it with the SBA and you don't do it with Treasury, you do it through your bank and your lender. And there's two things that really matter. The first, you have to spend the money right for it to be forgiven, and you have to track your spending for it to be forgiven. If you can do those two things, you're good to go. But there might be some tricky parts here. So let's answer some questions. Now, bear with me. This is more math than I, as a lawyer, ever want to do in my life, but I'm going to do it for you. For the purposes of the next 10 minutes, Here's the example we're using. A sole proprietor, okay, or an LLC tax as a sole proprietor or an independent contractor, right? Anyone self-employed or in that field. And if you look at this fictional person's 2019 Schedule C, line 31, which is net income, is 
okay? Which means that to get the amount of the PPP loan, you would take $12,000 divided by 12, which is $1,000 times 2.5, $2,500. I hope I did that math right. If not, someone yell at me. Now, we're also assuming they don't have any idea alone. And we also finally assuming that this person wants to get this money forgiven so that it doesn't turn into a two year 1% loan. Okay, those are our assumptions. So remember that for what we're talking about. First thing you gotta do, spend it right. Here are the rules. You must spend 75% of it on payroll costs. What are payroll costs? And I had a wonderful question come in this morning um, uh, up from Oregon about what are payroll costs and is health uh, healthcare included in it? So let me just go right down the list from the law. Salaries, wages, vacation pay, parental and family leave, medical benefits, sick leave, and other health benefits. If you are paying the employee side of, of the healthcare, then that falls under medical benefits, that falls under payroll costs. If you, are, if you have a sick leave policy in place, then you can include it. You can't just start up new policies, okay? Um, and we're gonna look at something about that in a second. But this is where we can roll in our employer paid healthcare costs, okay? Those are what our payroll costs, which means, 75% of the money that comes in must be spent here. 75 must be spent here. That doesn't mean you can't spend more here. You just have to use at least 75% of that. Now, remember you're a sole proprietor, you might say, well, I don't wanna pay myself that, or I wanna pay myself more than that, or whatever the case is. And we're gonna look at what a sole proprietor can pay themselves in just a second. With the remaining 25%, you can use it for the following. Well, you can use the other 25% also for payroll costs. You're not limited, you just must use 75% for payroll costs. And remember, you can use uh, the other 25% for these other things that are forgivable expenses. Interest on a mortgage, business rent, business utility. But note, the mortgage interest, the business rent, the utilities must be for accounts that were already established before uh, February 15th, 2020. You can't get this money in the bank and then start opening new accounts and paying those accounts with this and then assuming that that's forgivable. It has to be for things that were established prior to 2015 or um, February 15th, 2020. So here's the breakdown. 75% on payroll costs and the remainder on the things that are listed above. Now you gotta track it. Because remember, you have to apply for this loan with a bank or a lender, and then you have to apply for forgiveness with the same bank or lender. It does not happen automatically. And different banks and lenders are gonna ask for different things. But here's what we kinda know right now. One, you should record this in your bookkeeping, whether you do it yourself or you have a bookkeeper or CPA, you should record this as a loan. And you really need to keep good books here. You want to record the amount, the people or the companies involved, the type of expense it was, the date, all that kind of stuff. Keep really good records. How long do you need to track this? Well, it's very, very clear and this is likely not to change. The minute that money hits your account starts the eight week clock and you have eight weeks to the exact day, you add up all those expenses and then that is the amount that is eligible for forgiveness. Okay. You cannot hold on to it. You cannot pay yourself the, you know, the money you should have paid yourself last month. You can't pay yourself in advance for next month. It is that eight week period that you have to use that money for current expenses and there do not seem to be any loopholes in that, okay? And then you gather all this info and you send it in to your bank or your lender. You gotta remember to apply here. Don't think that it's gonna be automatic and then you're gonna get a bill that says you owe money because this is a loan. You don't wanna get that bill, apply for forgiveness. Question that's come up a lot. How much can a sole proprietor pay themselves with PPP 
money and have it still be forgiven. All right, here we go. This is gonna be the intellectual hard part for me today because there's some money. Going back to our example, uh, we have a PPP loan amount in, uh, of $2,500, right? Remember the person had 12,000 on their line 31 and net income divided by 12 times 2.5. $2,500 hit their bank account today. And so we now have to spend that money according to the rules I just gave you, right? In the next eight weeks. If you are a sole proprietor or an independent contractor or an LLC tax as a sole proprietor or anything like that, you look at line 31 again, you go back to your schedule C, you look at line 31 and you divide that by the fraction eight over 52. The decimal that results from that is 0 0.154. So if we multiply 12,000, which remember was our examples line 31 times 0.154, that is the maximum you can pay yourself. That is called owner compensation amount. And in this case, the owner compensation amount in our example is $1,848. You cannot pay yourself all $2,500 and expect it to be forgiven if you're a sole proprietor. You can only pay yourself the equivalent of eight weeks that you, on average, from your last year's Schedule C. Okay? You can only pay yourself that equivalent. Now, if you are a truly seasonal business, there may be some tricks here. We don't know. We're waiting on guidance for seasonal stuff, okay? But bottom line is, right now, here's what we know. Sole proprietors need to take line 31, multiply, or uh, 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 I'm sorry, I say divide there. Um, it's multiply by 0.154. Uh, let me, I'm going to fix that so we're clear. You want to get the amount that's 850 seconds of whatever your line 31 is. That's the maximum amount you can pay. So 12,000 times 0.154 equals your owner compensation amount, which is 1848. So what about the other 652? If you have excess money from that calculation, you have to think about how this is spent so it doesn't turn into a loan. You can use it for any of the other forgivable expenses we talked about. Interest on a mortgage, business rent, all that kind of stuff. What can't you do? You can't prepay your rent for next month. That's not a forgivable expense. You can't pay yourself what you would have been making during the two months you've been unemployed during the pandemic in the past. That's not forgivable. You can't say, you know what, I'm gonna be out of work next month and so I'm gonna save some of this money and pay myself in advance for next month. No go. Very straightforward calculation. The amount in uh, line 31 times 0.154 is the maximum that you can pay yourself. Now, last week, we had some questions. Do I have to pay myself? Can I pay myself in one lump sum? Can I pay myself weekly? Right now, I did a lot of investigation into that. Right now, it doesn't seem to matter. But I have a feeling that that's the type of thing that new guidance might, um, you know, uh, might adjust a little bit. But right now, uh, it seems like you could just pay yourself uh, as long as it's not above the owner compensation amount calculation we discussed. It seems like you could pay yourself in one lump sum. Other thing you can do, and I haven't seen this a lot of places, and no one's told me you can't do this. And logically, I think you can. So bear with me here. You can just hold on to that money, and that means that portion is not forgivable. Let's say you had $500 that was not forgivable. That $500 turns into a loan that's a two-year term with 1% interest. Those loans have no prepayment penalties. You just give them the money back. If you can't spend it on the things that are forgivable, just give them the money back. I think that that will take care of it. I've seen nothing to indicate the contrary. All right, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, the PUAs and unemployment. Tom, I don't know, uh, I probably have another 15 minutes or so. Do you want to take some questions on the PPP forgiveness right now and then do another set or how would you like to do it? Oh, you're muted.
Sorry. There you go. Yeah, here we go. Uh, yeah, we can do that. One thing that I did want to say, and this is something that has come up, and it cuts comes back to our the lobbying that Mike and Tom and I do, and that is, as you're probably deducing from listening to Tom's explanations today, the PPP comes with some tight, you know, tight parameters to it that really restrict how the money can be used and, and are very specific in that regard. And one of the things that I feel very strongly about from my position watching this play out and watching sort of how it does or doesn't map to the realities of everybody's businesses is the fact that I think we need to be arguing for the direct distribution of cash with far less strings going directly to uh, the smallest of small businesses, the micro businesses that Mike Clipper was referring to earlier. And uh, that's something that I really want to talk with Mike and Tom about on the backside of today's town hall, because I think we need to start making the case, as I'm starting to see it in mainstream media, that the way this is being handled is really not in alignment with the needs and the realities of the way that people that, that operate businesses that are on the call today do. So that's one thing I wanted to throw out there. So let me see if I can find a quick question. Regarding the PPP, this is from Chris C. Regarding PPP, if you are a sole proprietor with a home office, is it true that two months of salary is forgiven, but that you have to pay the remainder? I assume that means on mortgage. So, uh, right. So what, this is a, a great question, and it has to do with uh, essentially how the PPP was originally calculated. Remember, on our Schedule Cs, right, you were able to take expense deductions. And what those expense deductions did is they minimized the amount of your net income, which is what the PPP amount was based on. You're not allowed to include um, uh, uh, the equivalent of rent uh, or any other expense that, you know, business utilities is on there, all that kind of stuff. You're not allowed to include any of that unless it was something that you were uh, eligible for deduction for on your Schedule C. Now, that sounded a little confusing, and I really want you, if you are going to um, make sure you're maximizing forgiveness, I really want you to double check if a home office, if you have used it as a deduction on your Schedule C, you should be able to prorate that amount um, and use that as a forgivable amount, but that is one huge area I am waiting for accountants and I'm waiting for the SBA to clarify. Um, the bottom line on that is that you have to figure out what money you used as a, uh, uh, as a deduction in the calculation of the original PPP amount to determine if you can use it as a forgivable expense. Okay, this one from Tony A. Can I use 100% of the PPP for payroll? And I believe you've said yes to that. You can, unless you're a sole proprietor, right? And the reason being, if it's only you, you're a single member company, you can only use as much as the owner compensation amount formula we just talked about, which is line 31 times 0.154. That is the maximum. Now, if you have another employee, if you have uh, other things that would increase your, uh, your payroll expenses above 75%, for sure, feel free to spend more of that. That 75% is a floor, not a ceiling. The only caveat being if you're sole proprietor, you're limited to the owner compensation amount, um, which we went over in that formula. Okay, this is from JB. What type of accounting should I set up and use to comply with PPP forgiveness for sole proprietors with no employees? Yeah, so, you know, there are, you can use anything that's out there as long as it's kind of standard uh, accounting bookkeeping principles, right? You don't have to do anything fancy. You just have to be really careful about how you spend this money. I will give you a personal example and say that when I got my PPP loan, I moved it into a savings account, a business savings account that I had. And when I'm using it, for uh, the purposes specified, I transfer it to my operating account 
and then I spend the money from there. So there's a very clear trail that yes, this money was used for this thing and therefore it's forgivable. I don't think you have to do that. No one has said that you have to do that, but you need to really track that money. And frankly, any kind of paper trail is better than no paper trail. And so, you know, keep a little chart of accounts, even on an old school piece of paper or in a Microsoft Excel file or anything, just knowing here's the amount of money we started with, here are the forgivable expenses I used it for, and here are the evidence, the receipts, the invoices, whatever it is, the bills that you paid that were eligible, that is going to be what you need, how you used it, and some, some porting documents. Okay, this is from Ben C. Can I increase my W-2 salary or pay myself a bonus during the eight-week PPP period to maximize the forgivable amount of the loan that's going toward payroll? So there are uh, a couple rules uh, that are in there. First of all, this is another area ripe for new guidance. If you are a W-2 employee, the question is a little more confusing. Earlier, I talked about sole proprietors and can sole proprietors just pay themselves more? No, they can't. But if you're a W-2 employee and you're your only employee, could you, as the company, increase your salary for a set period of time? I'm going to answer that as maybe, but I think that's probably a bad idea, okay? I think that that's the type of thing that um, it seems like it's circumventing the system a little bit. And while I haven't seen that that is negative, I am concerned about it. Now, that brings up a good point. Let's say you have employees. Can you lower their um, salaries uh, and have it forgiven? Can you fire people and keep the money? The answer to both of those is no. Your headcount, the number of employees uh, you have, and the law refers to them as full-time equivalent, FTEs, the number of employees, uh, FTE employees you have, has to be the same during the eight-week period as it was on January 31, 2020. This is really gonna only apply when people have more than one employee, okay? And it's normally W-2 employees. The reason I'm bringing this up is to make one important point. That is, if you're in that situation, your employees do not have to be the same people you started with. Only the ratio of your full-time equivalent employees from January 30th, to the eight week span. Meaning, I could fire everyone who works for me and hire the exact same number of people and it's okay. That fulfills the rules, okay? One more rule. And the reason I didn't make a big deal about this is I think a lot of people don't have a lot of employees that are on this particular call, but one more rule in case you do. You cannot decrease your employees' salaries by more than 25% or else it won't be forgiven, okay? So uh, you can't have calculated your PPP amount based on having all these employees that you paid well, and then as soon as you get the money, you cut everyone to half pay so you can keep the money for other things. That doesn't work, that's not allowed. So those are two other little things that are involved in that, but you notice I said you can't decrease your employee's salary, but I didn't say you can increase it. And frankly, I think that's a question that's still up in the air, but that is something that I would be concerned about. And if we find any more information about it, I'll let you know. I would hold off on doing that until we know more. Okay, this is from Mike R. As a sole proprietor of getting PPP, my Schedule C should prove my payroll plus win forgiveness for the loan, correct? Is the EIDL 1000 a grant? The EIDL 1000 is an advance. Now, what that means is that if you have your, um, uh, if you ultimately get an EIDL loan, which I don't think anyone has, and I'm not sure it's been offered at this point, um, then that 1000 is something that would roll into the loan because it's an advance on the loan. If you don't get an EIDL loan, or, and this is my understanding, if you get an EIDL offer and choose not to take it, you do not have to pay that money back. So under no circumstances do you have to pay that $1,000 back. And to the other part of your question, 
does your line 31 account for your payroll uh, records to be forgiven? Yes, but make sure you're very clear on that calculation and how you pay yourself. If you wanna take whatever your owner compensation amount is and divide it by two and write yourself two checks, that's fine. If you wanna do it in one check right now, that looks like it will be fine, although I'm not entirely sure. Um, uh, but the whole point is that is if you're sole proprietor, the basis of your record keeping is going to be the calculation from line 31. Okay. This is from, uh, Lisa G, uh, coming out of Facebook, paying yourself a, as a sole proprietor LLC. Is it as simple as transferring money from a business account to a personal account? Will that satisfy the requirements of the PPP forgiveness? This is normally how I pay myself. Yeah, and it's how a lot of people pay themselves. And, and uh, uh, you know, with the caveat that guidance may change this, my, my belief and my, um, my inclination is that that's going to be just fine. Um, uh, now, bank transfers have very clear records. They have dates and timestamps and, you know, confirmation numbers and everything else. That I believe is evidence that should suffice uh, to prove that you paid yourself that amount. I don't think you have to, you know, write yourself a formal check and then cash it if that's not how you normally do things. If how you normally do things are bank transfers, make sure you do it so that you have the record and save that record. But most banks do that automatically now. Just download that and put that in a separate file, the receipt and the confirmation of transfer. That should be pretty good. Tom, why don't we go another five or six minutes? We'll do uh, the next two sections, and then we'll get back to questions. Okay. So you want me to ask a couple more? Yeah, let's do two more. Okay. Here's one from Gail Z. Is PPP is using PPP funds to pay business insurance forgivable under the mm. terms of the Act? Yeah. So the Act only says the things I mentioned. And so the question then is business insurance, a business utility. That's really the only place it might fit in there. Um, that is an answer that my inclination is going to be no, but I haven't seen guidance specific to that. That is the type of thing that the first time the SBA comes out with a whole bunch of uh, new rules and FAQs about this is gonna be cleared up. I've gotten that question a few times. For now, I would not say that that would be considered a forgivable expense. So I'm going to err on the side of no until the SBA tells me otherwise. Okay, and this one from Terry on Twitter. If I use my PPP money to pay my 2019 taxes, will I have to pay back the PPP money as a, as a loan? Absolutely. You can only use it for those reasons. And if you don't use it for those reasons and you use it to pay something like your 2019 taxes, that will become a loan and you will have to pay that whole thing back. Don't okay. do that. Figure it out another way. I know this is tough, especially for micro businesses. This is tough because you have this money, you've been out of work, you need to spend it on stuff. But if you wanna get that forgiveness, you gotta to toe the line here. We hope that this is all going to work out fine, and I really think it is, but you have to, you, everyone on this, on this webinar, and everyone um, who reads the articles we're writing will already be ahead of the game, because frankly, there's going to be a lot of people that use it in ways that aren't acceptable, that are going to be real surprised when they get a loan. So be careful about this. Okay, one last one from Adam A., as a sole proprietor, if my line 31 is over 100,000 and my loan is based on the 100,000 in payroll, is the forgivable loan based on th line 31 or the loan amount? That's a great question. Now, uh, I believe in, in this is one area where uh, I am going to uh, turn to my wonderful staff because I just read an article about this probably about four days ago and it's slipping my mind right now. Um, and so what I'm going to ask is them to look up your question. And the question essentially that we're looking up is, if you base the PPP amount on a maximum amount, which was 100000 you couldn't have more than that as a function. That means, I believe, that your, um, uh, your PPP loan related to that employee was 8000 something 400 something whatever the case. 
when you're looking at loan forgiveness and you're figuring out how much you can use of that amount to pay yourself, you have to figure out then, it, do you use the large amount or the 100,000? My gut is saying 100,000, I think that's what I read, but my staff is gonna figure that out and we're gonna have an answer for you here within 20 minutes. And they better be paying attention. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna jump back in on things because um, uh, we got a lot that we wanna cover. Okay, so, um, and you can still see this, right? Looking good? Looking good. All right. So let's talk about this beast. And I am livid over this because I've been hearing from members that this isn't working for them. And it, in the last two weeks, I have done and my team have done a deep dive into this. So I'm going to tell you what we know now. And what we know now is that this is a mess. Okay? Let me just be super upfront about it. There's no way to sugarcoat it. This is a mess. People are being hurt by this. There are two main issues we're seeing. So the first is that some states still do not have a pathway to do a PUA application for self-employed. You, you, you can't even do it. They're telling you they're not taking application. We are now almost, uh, almost seven weeks uh, or more since the CARES Act was passed. And that had the PUA program that was supposed to um, help uh, everyone uh, who was self-employed, sole proprietor, independent contractor. And many states don't even have this set up yet. It is terrible. But more terrible is when a state has it set up, has the PUA application ready to go, they're set up. And people who have both W-2 income and 1099 income, are specifically excluded from the PUA program, okay? This isn't okay. And this is where, you know, Mike and Tom and I talk about advocacy, but this is a critical piece. We are working with the federal government, we're talking to states, and we're trying to get revisions made so the language that will fix this actually gets through. Here's what happens, and um, uh, Victoria, uh, who is a, um, a, a recent law school graduate. In fact, her graduation was today, and so congratulations to Victoria. Victoria looked this up, and what she found is that the state unemployment people are saying, you know what, uh, this is a federal problem. The Department of Labor is saying, well, this is what the law says, and so we don't know how to interpret this. And the person who needs to decide here is Congress. And that's why what Tom Kennedy and Mike Clipper are doing is so critical. Congress has to clarify this because right now it's not working. I'm gonna show you exactly how it's not working in a second. Here's where we stand today. Unemployment is a state issue. Your first stop all the time should be to get in touch with your state if you can. not Many of you have been on the phone uh, for tens or hundreds of hours. You've sent a million emails. You have not gotten a response. What I'm gonna to say to you is keep going. Keep slogging through, keep getting on hold. Make this your job. This matters, you have to get through to get the information. Will the information you get when you get through be accurate? Yeah, I've heard a lot of stories that it's not because I don't think states by and large have any idea what they're doing with this. This is why the federal government needs to add some clarity. The Department of Labor needs to add some guidelines and we need to fix this. More and more states are implementing the pandemic unemployment assistance application. We're happy to see that. But like I talked about a few weeks ago, the PUA only is, is, available to people who are not eligible for traditional state unemployment. What that means in many states is that to even apply for PUA, you have to apply for regular unemployment, get denied, and then apply for PUA. That is ridiculous. There needs to be a way around that. And what the states are saying is the law forces us to do that, which to be frank, I think it's bullshit. We gotta figure out 
how we can get this done in a way that isn't ridiculous. This hurts mixed workers. And mixed workers is a term that uh, I just encountered in, in the last few weeks that I think is absolutely appropriate here. As it stands now, if you derive the majority of your money from freelance work or other work where you're paid by 1099, which affects a lot of ASMP members, a lot of photographers, but you have some level of nominal income, then you are entirely shut out of the PUA program. At least that's what many states have been telling people. This is not okay, okay? The reason is that when we talk about mixed workers, let me, uh, let me go into this a little bit. What's happening here is W-2-based employees are the ones that have been traditionally eligible for state unemployment. So when you apply, they say, did you earn any W-2 income last year? And you say, yes, I did. You're instantly categorized as someone who is eligible for state-run unemployment traditionally, which means, by law, you are not eligible for the PUA program. That's what the law says. This was an oversight, I have to imagine, because here's what this means. If you make $50,000 through 1099 income and you make $2,500 through W-2, your unemployment benefits are based on the $2,500 and not the $50,000. They're just ignoring the $50,000. And I'll tell you, if you've come to all these open houses or uh, town halls, you've heard me a few weeks ago say, that's ridiculous. I need to call the state about that. That doesn't make any sense. And then we started calling some states and looking into what the language is. And it is ridiculous, but it's happening. This is going to be, you know, Tom and, and Mike uh, work a lot on a lot of big projects, um, you know, the CASE Act and certainly all the COVID-19 stuff. This is my little corner of advocacy that I am going to be fierce about, along with Tom and Mike, because I think this is something that could be easily fixed, but has to be fixed. Because right now, many states, California, Colorado, many others are saying, you cannot get assistance through the PUA program if you have any amount of W-2 income, which is not okay. That is not a hopeful note. I am not telling you here's the way around this. And the reason I'm not telling you that is because there is not a way around this that I can currently find. But we're gonna to try to make one. And that's why advocacy is critical. All right. I'm um, gonna run through, oh yes. I'm gonna interrupt for one minute and ask that we all take a moment of silence to honest the greatest generation on today, the 75th anniversary of victory in Europe particularly recognizing those who fought and especially those who gave the ultimate sacrifice. So if we can just take about 10 seconds, we'll resume our program. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. Uh, um, that's a thoughtful uh, consideration and uh, a needed um, respite in the middle <laughs> of, of what, we're, what we're doing here. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears and we're going to answer questions about PPP forgiveness. We're going to ask questions about PUA. We're going to answer questions about anything else you want to talk about. I mean, let's keep it law or photo related, please. And uh, I don't know much more about anything else. But I want to finish with one topic that we've been getting a lot of questions about in the last week and in the last two weeks. And so many that we have uh, put together a program that I think is going to be pretty exceptional. And this is all about how you go back into the market, how you go back on set, how you go back on location and be safe when you're trying to work in the middle of a pandemic. So Wednesday, May 13th uh, at 3 p.m. Eastern, we're gonna be doing ASMP safety while shooting. This is a guide for photographers. I am doing this webinar. I will likely have some wonderful guests with me. We're still hammering out all the details on that. 
um, it, it, I promise I'm going to try to break up just me talking uh, for a while. But we're going to be going deeper than I get to go on the town halls. And we're going to be talking about two main areas, health and legal, right? So on the health side, if you're on set, how do you evaluate symptoms? of your assistants, of your models, of whoever. How, what's the best practice for cleaning and, and what's the difference between cleaning and disinfecting and what are you responsible for and what are you not responsible for? We're gonna talk about how many clients you should see in a day. We're gonna talk about how you deal with hair and makeup issues where people have to be in very close proximity to each other. Uh, we're gonna talk about the number of sessions you should have and the number of assistants you should have. We're gonna talk about what happens if someone shows up and they seem like they're sick, but they say they're fine and what you have to do as the photographer on the set. But we're also going to get into the legal side. You know, I mentioned earlier, if you are an employer um, and that means anyone who hires assistants, hires, you know, models, hires hair and makeup artists, you know, even if they're considered independent contractors, you're their employer that you have legal responsibilities for their health and safety, for the health and safety of others around them, right? If something happens, you need to make sure that you have the right policies and the right waivers, that you have new things that are in your contracts. Um, and we're going to be providing a lot of information next Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern, uh, in a webinar I'm doing on uh, shooting safely. This is ASMP's guide. It's going to have, we're going to have handouts. We're going to have a lot of different things going on. You can register at the bit.ly link that's right there. That's bit.ly slash ASMP dash safety. I really hope to see you all there. Tell your friends about it. It's going to be an important one and it's going to answer a lot of the questions that we've been getting. Um, uh, I wanted to wait until we dove into that, until the landscape became a little clearer, until people started going back to work a little bit, and it sounds like that's happening. And by the number of questions I'm getting about this, I'm actually thrilled because that means people are finding paying jobs, they're getting back to work a little bit. I'm very happy to hear that. All right. One thing to mention. Many of you know that ASMP has a 501c3 foundation um, that is a totally separate entity, but of course uh, attached. Um, and we, uh, we love the foundation, our 501c3. They're introducing a new program. And there's kind of two programs in one here. And the first is this idea of a donor circle. And what the donor circle is, is people are donating uh, certain amounts of money. And that money right now is going towards an emergency grant program. And ASMP Foundation is going to be giving grants of $250. And we're going to be giving it to anyone in the industry, photographers, models, assistants, digital techs, hair and makeup people, uh, all of the people in the industry are going to have a chance to apply for these and we're going to just make sure that they're actually in the industry and then we're going to randomly choose people and we're going to send them some money. That is a program put on by the ASMP Foundation, the new donor circle. More information on this and applications on this should be opening up here uh, shortly uh, or early part of next week. And uh, if you want to be part of the donor circle and support this mission with a totally tax deductible 501c3 donation, you can. And if you are in need of the emergency grant, you can apply for that as well. I will tell you this started by a wonderful ASMP member, I believe out of Minnesota, who got their $1,200 stimulus check and reached out and said, you know what, things are okay at the moment, but I'd really like to put this to good use. And it was based on that seed money that the ASMP Foundation developed this emergency grant program. And it's something that uh, we'll be um, sending more information out about and you're gonna see it on the ASMP site. We're really proud of the work that, um, that we can do on the charitable side as well to help photographers. So we're gonna talk in a second and we can talk about the PPP, we can talk about loan forgiveness, we can talk about unemployment, all the different options there. If you're a mixed worker, and by that I mean you have a 1099 income and W-2 income, and you've had trouble with your state unemployment office, please send me a message. Send it to legal at ASMP.org. When we're all doing the advocacy work, 
it really is great to be able to point to specific instances of people who, who have run into these roadblocks and that will really help us. I want you to know what ASMP is doing as well. You know, these town halls, this is our eighth one. Uh, we've answered hundreds and hundreds of questions. We've tried very hard to get out in front of a lot of this. And many of you are seeing your EIDL money, your PPP money come in, and I could not be more happy for you. Uh, this is what Tom and Mike and I and the whole team at ASMP has been looking to see happen and it's finally starting to happen. We're really, we're really thrilled by this. Now, one thing is you heard me at the top, ASMP National, the ones who put on all these programs is not a 501c3. That means we're not eligible for the stimulus packages that, that everyone, all other businesses are eligible for. And because of that, we really ask that if you had good information, if you got good information, if you've been able to derive value from what we've been doing in these last two months and all the different things we've been doing on webinar Wednesdays and podcasts and everything, please consider donating or supporting ASMP National with any amount. And you can do that at bit.ly slash ASMP dash support. That is the type of funding that helps us to continue these programs because you can imagine, you know, it's, it's tough right now for all photographers. And when you're a photography trade association, this is more important than ever. We really hope we've been working hard for, for everyone here, uh, not only who are members, but everyone in the industry. And so if you find value in that, please do consider supporting ASMP National at bit.ly slash ASMP dash support. Finally, I'll say those Wednesday webinars, uh, remember the one we're doing here is ASMP, uh, uh, the safety guide that's gonna be next Wednesday at three. If you missed the last Wednesday webinar with Tom Kennedy and, and uh, Sibylla, um, that, was, uh, that was incredible. You definitely should go back and watch that. It's on our Vimeo channel, it's on our website. Uh, really, really great stuff. We we're really happy with that. With all that being said, Let's do some questions. You got me for a while. I'm ready to go. Okay, Tom, I'm going to start. And Mike, I'm going to start with something that came out that Darren C. asked. And I think it's apropos of what we've just been talking about with regard to how uh, convoluted some aspects of the law have result, you know, have caused, you know, the, you know, the damage they're causing. Um, during the second round of the EIDL applications, it's being restricted, as you mentioned, to agricultural business. Can the SBA unilaterally rewrite a law passed by Congress and, and impose those uh, restrictions? It's a great question. And, and the way I'd answer it, and, and again, I am not a uh, legislative scholar, but the way, way I read it is that what the CARES Act did is it allocated a certain amount of money to the SBA to distribute related to this economic injury disaster that we're in. And remember, the EIDL program predated the CARES Act. What the CARES Act did was create the EIDL Advance Program, that EIDL kind of what people are calling the grant program, right? And so based on my reading of the CARES Act, essentially money was, uh, was allocated to the SBA but the SBA gets to write the rule on that. Is that right, Mike? I would think so, unless the act especially authorizes them to do more than that, it'll be up to Congress to, to redraft it or to amend it. Yeah, so, yeah, so yeah. you know, if they can, if they can say, uh, we can limit this to agricultural entities, I think the SBA can say that because they were given the authority to do that when they received the money, I, I think. But this is exactly why, you know, the three of us are going to continue to do lobbying and try to pose a different solution for the smallest of small businesses, because we think this is incredibly unfair, the way this, what Tom was just describing is happening. So let's go to Rena L. If I have a full-time job and also my own photography business, Am I not eligible for compensation for my photography business, which is obviously shut down by the pandemic? Well, you are eligible for your uh, for compensation from the PPP program and the EIDL program, frankly. 
um, you would not be eligible through any kind of unemployment if you have a full-time job. But there is nothing in there that says you can't get a PPP loan uh, based on you also have another job. Because remember, the PPP amount is based on your line 31 if you're a sole proprietor. I'm just going to assume for the moment you are. And so if that number was low last year because you had another full-time job, that's fine. Your PPP amount will be low. You're not excluded from that on that side. You would likely be excluded on the state unemployment side. Okay. This one from Alan Kay. Hello. I applied for PPP early and was advised by the lender that the application was submitted and pending on the second round of funding, but received no other word. As a precaution, I applied on May 4th to PayPal. Later that same day, I received word from both the first lender and the, that the application was approved by SBA and an ETRAN number issued, but have not received any further communication or closing documents. I was notified the next day by PayPal that my application was approved and have received the closing documents, but not acted on them. The amount offered by the first lender is higher as it includes that employee salary that was deducted from the calculation on Schedule C, line 31, but added back in, and, but added back in. PayPal did not allow this in their calculation. Should I accept the lower PayPal loan or wait, hoping closing documents from the first lender will be received and go through? Is there a chance of having the two loans penned? Sure. So about three, four days ago, I got a call from an ASMP member who is in a situation that I have never seen I haven't seen yet. And that is they had received two PPP loans where the money had actually gone into their accounts. And when I heard that, I went online and I tried to do some searching as to other people who that has happened to. And I have found no one who that has happened to. That is a, I'm not saying that now, I'm not saying that's impossible. I might've said it was very unlikely a few weeks ago, but to the second part of your question, I would guess that since you have been allocated and have closing documents on one, you have essentially been rejected from the other, okay? Um, uh, unless you're in this incredibly rare boat um, that the other ASMP member finds themselves. Um, but what I told them is, is if that is the case, here's what I will tell everyone who is similarly situated. Don't spend anything until one bank or lender takes the stuff back, okay? Now, by and large, if you have been approved and the money's been allocated from the SBA, right, then you likely, um, any other applications you had will, will be rejected. That is almost universally what's been happening. So, Alan, in your case, what I would say is you want to make sure that money isn't, isn't you know, coming in uh, from two directions. You don't want to take two loans. But frankly, you know, you got to figure out, is the amount real different? Because if you don't take the one that's in front of you while you're waiting for the other one to, quote, process, it's likely that other one has already been rejected. You just don't know it, right? Or the bank doesn't know it yet um, because the SBA rejected it due to a duplicate EIN or SSN. And if that's the case, you don't want to reject the one you have for this other one. I would try to get as much clarity as I can. I know it's terribly hard to get in touch with these lenders. Uh, I wrote a message to a lender about four days ago. I just saw when we were getting on this town hall that they had responded. Um, you know, try to get some additional clarity. Uh, don't foreclose yourself from anything at the moment. And if the, if the lender who has closing papers in front of you says, hey, you have 24 hours to fill this out, my vote is fill it out. I'd rather you have uh, money coming in that you have to figure out what to do with than you're locked out of the program because you weren't able to accept something timely. Okay, this one from Aubrey H. I have received 1,000 EIDL and then was approved for PPP after. The bank did not subtract 1,000 from the PPP amount. What do I do? The bank should not have subtracted the thousand from the PPP amount. Great question. So 
when you look at the PPP application, it has you do that whole calculation, you know, divide your average monthly, uh, your total yearly by 12, and then your average monthly is this times 2.5. Then it says, if you've received an EIDL loan, subtract that or add it in net minus the other thing, right? But the other thing, the advance, because you don't have to pay it back, doesn't fall into this category. For the first time, I saw a question, and I forget where I saw it, but I saw it today, that said uh, they had taken out the 1000 for the EIDL. Based on my reading and everyone I'm talking to, that's incorrect. They should not have taken out the 1000 They should only mess with the EIDL stuff in relation to the PPP if you've gotten an official EIDL loan, not just the advance. Now, if your situation is different than the one I just mentioned, and you actually have gotten an EIDL loan, then I would think about it, but I will tell you both from personal experience and looking at now probably thousands of these that the uh, PPP amount should not be affected by any EIDL advance. It would be affected by an EIDL loan, but not the advance. Okay, this is from Dave M. If I apply for PUA and receive money during my PPP period for time prior to the PPP period, Will that be an issue? And as an example, in his state, the response generally for PUA is about 28 days. Right. So remember that state unemployment works on weeks and benefit weeks, right? And let's say that they took a long time to figure out how, you know, that you were unemployed and processing and everything, and you're currently getting those, those uh, benefits for the weeks that you were unemployed prior to receiving the PPP money that should be fine because you were unemployed then and you weren't guaranteed any kind of PPP money, right? Now, once you get the PPP money, you likely will have to stop accepting benefits from the state unemployment office, okay? And if you stop accepting benefits, then your benefit weeks pause. And in many states, you can use them again in um, uh, after the PPP runs out and if you're still considered unemployed under the various state provisions, okay? So if you're, accept if you're getting money now based on the fact that you were unemployed a month ago before you got PPP, I, uh, everything I've been seeing uh, indicates that that's just fine. You just don't wanna take any money for benefit weeks that is also covered in the eight week span by the PPP. Okay, Tom, this is uh, from two individuals, actually variations of the same question, which is, can you get a PPP loan and also get PUA employment, unemployment at the same time? And if so, you know, and how do you negotiate all of that? Um, I'm sorry, say that again, Tom. It says, can you get a PPP loan and also get PUA unemployment at the same time? Because apparently a couple of states are allowing that to occur. So... This is where I think any guidance that comes out from the Department of Labor is going to be clear that that is not okay if you are a sole proprietor or self-employed or an independent contractor. The story is different if you're a W-2 employee. And the reason the story is different is that you as a W-2 employee have a right to go get unemployment, even if you're the owner of the company, because the company still has other employees to pay and business utilities and rent. So you can get a PPP for that if you don't have enough money in the PPP to pay yourself, right? So the, you can do both if you're in a situation where you are a W-2 employee. Um, and, uh, but in most cases, what we're seeing is um, that if you're a sole proprietor, anything like that, then you absolutely can't do it at the same time. You just need to talk to your unemployment office. Okay, and I guess this is another kind of variation on this, Tom. Jonathan K asks, how do I receive the money going back the last six weeks from New Jersey unemployment and account for the PPP loan that I received this week going forward for the next eight weeks? I have not received any of the money yet from in New Jersey unemployment but I just became eligible to receive my benefits this week. What should I do? Uh, Tom, um, uh, I'm gonna, 
I want to pull that up here. Um, I think is okay. that in the Q and A box or is that? Yeah, it is. Somewhere? Yep. I want to make sure I nail this. At one. three three at uh, three thirteen. Okay, great, perfect. Give me one second, and I'm gonna. Okay, perfect. Uh, there were a couple at three thirteen. That's exciting. Okay. Um, okay. Right. So the question is, can you sit on those PPP funds? Right, we're looking at Ben C's question, Tom? No, uh, Jonathan K. Uh, read it for me one more time. I'm sorry about that. Read How it do I I'm receive not the money going back the last six weeks from New Jersey unemployment and account for the PPP loan that I have received this week going forward for the next eight weeks? I have not yet received New Jersey unemployment, but just became eligible to receive my benefits this week. What do I do? Perfect, perfect. So when you apply for unemployment at the state, you have to indicate the date you became unemployed. And the CARES Act eliminated the seven day waiting period. So often the date you became unemployed counts as week one of your unemployment benefits. So if it's been six weeks since you were officially eligible under your state's rules for unemployment, then those are six benefit weeks that you're entitled to even if you haven't been paid. So let's say now, the beginning of week seven, you get your PPP and your sole proprietor. Then any benefits that the state attempted to pay you for week seven through 15, that eight week period, you would not accept. And then you would start again with the equivalent of week seven after your PPP ended, right? So you are able to get money from unemployment while you get your PPP money if it's for past benefit, right? Past benefit weeks. So the trick there, again, every state's going to do it a little different, but that's the trick. And Tom, I want to follow up on one thing real quick. Um, uh, uh, on the EIDL with the PPP, on many applications, on many applications, it asks, have you received an EIDL, an economic injury disaster loan? And if so, what's the amount? Now here's the tricky part. You should answer no to that. You should answer no to that because the EIDL advance is not an EIDL loan, okay? And so if you said yes, and then you wrote in a thousand because you know it sounds the same that the EIDL advance is part of the EIDL loan. In this case, it's not. And what some uh, I've just seen, I'd heard from the person who uh, I uh, referenced earlier, uh, they sent me the paperwork from the lender and the lender says, we have also uh, removed the thousand dollars for your EIDL. Well, that's not, that's not the key. The key is that an advance shouldn't be used uh, to uh, change the amount of the PPP, only an official loan. And almost no one's gotten a loan for that yet. And so that may be something to reach out to the lender about because very clearly on the treasury application and other places, the EIDL advance does not factor into what we're talking about. Okay, so do you want to change it up a little bit and I'll take a couple of questions regarding uh, COVID-19 and the reopening of things and then we'll go back yeah, to let's do the it. financials. Uh, this one from Kevin F. What COVID contract release language should I have for a new shoot that would protect us from lawsuits? Yeah, so on the legal side, there's a few things we're thinking about, right? The first is what needs to go in contracts when you're looking at liability protection. Here's the issue. The contract for someone who shoots on location is significantly different than the contract for someone who shoots in a studio. The contract that you might have uh, with an editorial client is different than a commercial client. And the settings for all that are completely different, right? And because of that, um, there might not be a complete set of standard language that every photographer should use because you have to think of the difference. Now, there are some basic provisions and I am gonna get a lot more into this next week on Wednesday with some actual examples of clauses we've been writing. But one thing that is hard 
it's hard for ASMP to write something that can be used in every situation. This isn't like a model release, right? This is something that is very different. So many of my clients have been reaching out to me uh, and my law firm here in Dallas to help them write very specific language for their contracts. Again, if you're getting back to work, that may be something you want to think about, reaching out to an attorney and getting something custom for what you're doing. Because what I'm writing is a lot different for studio shooters than on location shooters, et cetera. Here are the things you really want to think about. One, you have to have what we call an assumption of risk statement, which says, hey, client, if you're working with me on this, we are going to do our very, very best to make sure everything's safe and above board. But you're assuming the risk. And that means that if anything bad happens in the future, if you get sick, if one of your people gets sick, you can't come back at us and, and, and say, hey, it's your fault. Now, does that mean that's going to be rock solid and no one's ever going to sue you if something happens? Absolutely not. People can sue for anything. But you definitely want to have an assumption of risk waiver in there. The other thing that's critical, and this is different than what you might put in your contracts, the other thing that's critical are your policies and your waivers and your procedures that are separate from the contract that op that tell you as a business owner how you operate and you've got to have these right now if something ever happens the first thing some lawyer who's suing you is going to say is show me the policy the safety policies that were in place as of this date and if you say well you know we just wore masks that's not going to cut it you have to have written policies about safety the protocols you're following and how you derive those policies. If you are a shooter and you have assistance, you better be darn sure that those assistants have read and abide by those policies and have probably signed something. You need to have waivers for anyone who comes onto the set. We're gonna talk about all that kind of stuff. This isn't like something we can just put a few sentences on. And the reason is that it, it's not just a contractual issue, it's an employer workplace issue. And you might not think of yourselves as employers with a workplace, but you sure are. When you're shooting on location, if you're in a client's building, that one room you're shooting in is your workplace and it's your job to adhere to policies and procedures. And we're gonna get into all the details of that because what I just said probably scares you. And I'm gonna be honest, it probably should. You gotta think hard about this. This isn't something to play around with. Okay, Tom, this is another one that's interesting to me. Ryan S. asks, what is the legality of shooting during the stay-at-home order? Right. So what we're seeing are many states and counties and places are starting to open up again a bit, which hopefully is going to make this question every week that goes by be something that isn't quite at the forefront. But if you are in a place that has a mandated stay at home order, there will be some documents associated with it that indicate what are essential businesses, right? You also, there's a document that's put out, I believe by the Department of Defense, um, surprisingly, which identifies 17 industries that are considered critical to the nation's infrastructure. And there's things in there that you might not think would be in there. There's moving companies, there's buses and transportation, there's, you know, electricians, there's all the type of things that you might not think. Now, are photographers listed? No, photographers aren't listed. But could you be doing an essential job for an essential worker, even if you yourself are not considered essential? Maybe. And it comes down to what the uh, rules requirements and laws say where you are. So the first thing to do is uh, get your state stay at home order and start looking through it very in a very detailed way as to what counts as an essential business. Then you want to look for a provision in there that says other workers who provide services to essential businesses are also considered essential. That is in a lot of them, but it's also not in a lot of them. You've got to find it. And then finally, take a look at that Department of Defense uh, PDF, and uh, we'll get a link to it here uh, in the chat in a second, which goes over the 17 critical infrastructure uh, uh, essential groups. Um, you can fit a lot of things in there, uh, frankly. 
So you got to look at your local ordinances and read it carefully. Okay, and this one, these are, this is going to be a kind of a fusion, Tom, of two questions that I see you asked, and it's about hair, makeup, fashion stylists, or, you know, people supplying props to a shoot. What are the liability issues for this and what kind of, you know, what happens if anybody becomes ill once studios are allowed to open? It's really yeah. two-parter, I guess. Yeah, you know, we want to keep, obviously, everyone wants to keep everyone safe, right? And uh, here in Dallas, um, our governor about a week ago opened up, um, opened up the state uh, and uh, essentially invalidated the stay-at-home orders that were put in place by the counties. Uh, today, one week later, uh, salons and gyms and other things are open um, here, which is uh, um, a bit surprising. And, you know, uh, I will hold on to my opinions about things. But what you see and I have a lot of clients who are retail clients. I have a lot of clients who own businesses and have workers. What you see is that you have to have these policies. A very good, uh, a very good friend of mine uh, owns a camera store here in town. And um, you have to have everyone who comes in have a mask. You have to take people's temperature. You have to chart that kind of stuff. And you've got to do that on set. You better do that with your hair and makeup artists. You better do that with your models. And you might be thinking, well, why would, I, why would I do that? And that's because of the second part of your question, which is what happens if someone gets sick? Well, we don't know yet. One thing that I think Mike Clipper and Tom have heard a lot about, I don't think we've been overly involved in it, is uh, protecting business owners from liability and one of the bills that's being kicked around is the fact that a lot of people want business owners uh, to be protected in these situations. But other people say, well, what if you have business owners that aren't following the right procedures? Should they just be some blanket indemnification? Frankly, this is a lot harder a topic than you might imagine it is because you are business owners at the same time. You're not, you know, some Fortune 500 with all these policies and procedures. But I'm going to tell you, you're going to need to get the policies and procedures. And it is my hope that uh, after the webinar on Wednesday, again, which is free, y'all, it's totally free. After the webinar, we're going to be putting out documents and policies or templates, things that you can use um, when you're developing your own policies and procedures. It's not a requirement that you take someone's temperature when they walk into your retail store here in Dallas. It is something that stores individually are requiring. The difference there is that you have to do whatever keeps your place safe. If you and the store down the street, if you and the photographer down the street are shooting the same thing and you have all these precautions in place and they don't, and someone on each of your sets gets sick, you're gonna be real happy that you had your policy set up and they're gonna be real unhappy they didn't. Okay, Tom, we'll return to some of the other financial questions now. Sure. Uh, Mike R. indicates that he just calculated his payroll via owner compensation and that 75% of his PPP, or sorry, 74% of his PPP. Is he just out of luck? <laughs> um, so uh, this has, <laughs> I read an article the other day, can you round up from 74 to 75? Here is something that I think, uh, I forget if there's already guidance about it. If there's not, um, they're likely this will be just fine. Remember though, forgiveness is not all or nothing. Forgiveness is not all or nothing. At the worst, you might have to take that 1% difference as a loan. And then you know what I do? I would immediately pay it back and be done with it. Um, that 1% wouldn't be forgiven. It's not the whole loan in its entirety. Okay. And you've done the best, you've given it your best shot. Um, I'm, I think that that will be taken care of and I don't think that should be an overriding concern. I just okay. put the link to that PDF in, in chat for y'all. Okay, great. Um, and, and we'll go back to another uh, question on safety. And this one is coming from Steve on Twitter. Is there any hope that the complexities of working safely, legally and medically, Will, work, will result in a resurgence of professional photographers who can run a business in a way that non-pros can't. I mean, that's a 
that's a very interesting and open-ended question and we could probably do an entire webinar just on that one well you know what i honestly i had not thought about that until it was just said and then i immediately thought boy what a great way to position yourself uh, as a business as a photographer by putting right out front uh, your policies your procedures the fact that you're part of an organization like ASMP that is, you know, out in front and trying to keep everyone safe, not only the photographers, but the clients. And what a great differentiator when it comes to helping to gain business. And I sure hope it does. I think these are the type of things, just like you mentioned, that can really, really show that you are a professional, you are running a business, you're not just some fly by night thing. And um, I think clients are going to want to work with people. I, right now, I would rather go somewhere that has clear policies about how they're dealing with this than somewhere that doesn't. I think that's a really great point. Okay, and this one from Mike R. I'm a sole proprietor with no official payroll, and this week I got PPP and EIDL. The bank and SBA each say to talk to each other, talk to the other for what docs will grant forgiveness. 2019 Schedule C seems like the only possible doc. By definition, am I not using 100% of PPP for payroll, and should it, and it should be forgiven? Also, is the EIDL 1000 a grant? I think you've answered that. But that it is the EIDL 1000 is an advance. You don't have to pay that back, and you don't have to spend it on anything in particular. There is a little rule in there that says you can't spend it on the same things you're spending PPP on. Just use it for business expenses that aren't related to the five things you can spend PPP on is my general advice on the EIDL. You don't have to pay that back. You don't have to prove anything up with it. Okay. okay and if it's is, the EIDL advance. I'm ping now, ponging back and forth a little bit, but what do you suggest in terms of what methodologies do you suggest as being best for communicating your policies and procedures, website, blog, something else? Well, Tom, let me, can I, I want to answer the first part of the last one. I'm sorry. Sure, sure. Um, yeah. So on your PPP, yes, you're right. By definition, if you're a sole proprietor, you will not be spending 100% of it on your payroll. By definition, you won't, because remember the calculation is line 31 times 0.154, right? That's the maximum that you can uh, spend on yourself. So you have to find a way to spend the other amounts that are in the forgivable category. And then finally, what do you need to uh, provide to show forgiveness? That's going to be the SBA is not going to care. It's your bank. The bank is the one that is going to give you guidance. And if they can't do that yet, that just means they're not ready to do that yet. Most banks haven't. Most banks have just been saying track your accounts, but they haven't put out what would be considered loan forgiveness applications or anything like that. We don't know how that's going to go, but we're going to keep an eye on it. Okay, and this one from Megan B. You may have covered this, but I have applied for both PPP and unemployment. Unemployment will pay me more. Can I legitimately keep both? Since PPP only covers 2.5 months, I'm just about three weeks short of that. So then could unemployment cover the additional months until July 25th? So one point of clarification, PPP, even though it is calculated by 2.5 months, it only covers eight weeks. It only covers two months. It, that extra 0.5 of a month is, is extra money for you to spend on the purposeful things that you can use for the PPP. Now, again, this gets back into when are you considered unemployed and when are you considered employed? If you're a sole proprietor and you're getting PUA money, at the point you, you get your PPP money, you, in most states, uh, if you're sole proprietor, are going to have to not take the PUA money, even if it's more, you have to not take the PUA money. And then at the end of the eight weeks, you can take the PPP money again. Now, you, uh, the question is, can you, um, a question I got a few weeks ago, what if you don't want the PPP money? Because the PUA money is so much more. My response to that was, look, um, the PPP money is money that doesn't have to be paid back. But it's also money that's not taxable. Your unemployment amounts that you get, you have to pay income tax on. You do not have to do that with the PPP. That may make the calculation a little closer. 
at the end of the day, only you can decide, but if you're sole proprietor, independent contractor, self-employed, everything that I'm seeing says you can't have both at the same time, but you certainly can have both. If you're still unemployed at the end of the PPP period, then you can go back and get PUA uh, unemployment if you're still unemployed. Okay, this is from Darren C. I'm not seeing retirement plans benefits as, a, as listed on the payroll cost screen. Has that changed in the past week? So there's, um, let me uh, pull this out here and I will answer you specifically. Okay. Sorry, give me one second here and I'll pull this up. We had a question last week about the uh, SEP IRA. Um, and, we actually have a uh, few of those today as well. Okay, um, perfect. Well, uh, then, then especially bear with me as I pull this up because I'm going to show you exactly what uh, what we're looking at here. Oh, um, so remember, retirement obligations go into uh, payroll costs, and I'm going to show you what the Treasury officially says. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I uh, sometimes I have all this stuff, uh, uh, all this stuff queued up already. But that's a great question, and I will find it. Uh, Tom, if you have if you have two minutes of something to talk about, why don't you talk about something? <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, I think we're talking about a lot of things that are uh, making it clear. I hope to everyone that why you know as tom said earlier and mike has said why we're continuing to under what this helps us do is really understand what you're experiencing so that we can be very specific as we advocate for either changes in law or changes in policy that enable us to uh that would might enable you actually to find more meaningful relief and so i really value these interactions and the questions that we get typically to legal or communications at asmp.org because those two areas when we get the kinds of questions that you've been raising that just helps guide us in a particular way so tom i guess you're ready i'm i am ready retirement costs are part of of part of what we're talking about except it's a little trickier if you're self-employed okay they can go into payroll costs if it's a little trickier if you're self-employed. And the reason is that you have to delineate between the employer paid retirement and the employee paid retirement. And I noticed a, a, a question, uh, if I put money uh, in an SCP as a sole proprietor, is in this part of payroll? So retirement benefits are, the question is, how are they allocated? And here's what I want to do. I uh, am in the finishing stages of putting together an article on PPP loan forgiveness, which will go up at ASMP this week. And I'm going to do a whole subsection on retirement and S, uh, uh, SEP type uh, IRAs and um, uh, look for uh, concrete answers with links to the official law that's in there. But section 1102 of the CARES Act says retirement benefits are part of uh, payroll costs the question is, how is that actually implemented and who has to pay what and where? Um, and uh, I may, my staff may pop in with uh, a bit more clarification on that before the end of today, but I'm going to make sure it's super clear for everyone uh, here by this week. Okay, this one from my Nazelle. Read the PPP loan. What if you have some working capital in your account as a buffer already during this time and use the PPP loan for payroll and rent well i think that's absolutely fine remember the the uh the only thing you have to promise is that this pandemic has uh economically affected your business okay and if you now there's a new rule that was put in uh last week which essentially says i'm not looking at it in front of me but it essentially says if you have other sources of income uh, or you're adequately capitalized and you don't really need this money, you have access to other credit, you have lots of money, you know, your, your PPP is 20,000, but you have 10 million in the bank, 
then you are, have until May 14th to give the money back, that this money isn't meant for you. Now, I've had a couple of my clients who have said, look, I applied for this, and because my business has been hurt, at the same time, I have this huge line of credit over here, and my legal advice was you should probably give that money back because there's a new rule out from the SBA. Now, that's different from having some money in your account. The SBA and the Treasury are not assuming that everyone who uh, gets a PPP has zero dollars in their account. Yeah, you have some operating costs. You have some buffer in your account. And you'll notice, based on what I've just said, there's a huge gray area. When does a little bit of money in your account become too much and then you, no one has any clue. This is a giant gray area, okay? Now, let me say this, I would not worry one bit if you have some money in your account and you're using this to pay the forgivable expenses, it will still be forgivable, right? Especially if you had employees before, you probably sure did have money in your account because you had to pay, you know, you had to pay their paychecks uh, uh, before you got the PPP money anyway. So um, yeah, uh, I would not worry about that. Now, if we're talking a huge amount of money, uh, and the PPP is tiny in comparison, then you want to think if this new law is affecting you and you might have to give the money back. But that probably only is designed for bigger companies. I mean, bigger companies. So. Okay, and this one from Tracy B. Can you clarify if any health insurance plan paid by an employer counts? If I'm just myself and have an individual policy, does this count? So if you have an individual policy and you're a sole proprietor, then your is your business paying your, um, uh, your health insurance or is your business paying you and you pay your health insurance? There's a difference there, right? right. One is an employer paid health plan and the other is you just getting health insurance. If it is an employer paid health plan, then it's likely that you based part of your PPP uh, application amount on that, you know, based on the rules that deal with that. And will it be part that will be forgiven? Probably. And again, remember, I can speak real, real confidently now about what goes into a PPP calculation because we had four rounds of, of additional guidance from Treasury and the Small Business Administration. We've had no additional guidance on loan forgiveness. So some of these questions about loan forgiveness, I'm telling you what we think is gonna to happen today, but next week it could be different. But my view is that if it is a direct paid, employer paid health plan, then it should count as a, uh, a payroll cost that can be forgiven. That's my okay. opinion as of today. She's saying that business is paying for the health plan. That, that would be my two cents then, is that it will likely be included until I hear guidance otherwise, uh, or if I do, I'll let you know. Okay. This is from Megan M, or sorry, Megan B. In my unemployment application, it says I qualify for zero. I see online other people have encountered this as well. I am an S Corp, the only one in payroll, and have paid into unemployment with my corporation. My accountant says I should send them documents, but there was no ask for documents. What should I do? I presume this is the state agency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the question to me is, uh, you're an S-Corp, you're the only employee. Um, have you been paying yourself entirely W-2 income? Um, if, you, if you have, then you definitely need to appeal that decision and provide your W-2 income. If you've been paying yourself with some kind of owner's draw and a little bit of W-2 income, then that number might make some sense, right? because you've only been paying unemployment insurance uh, um, tax on the amount of W-2 income, not the amount of other income. So you, um, you definitely, almost every state has an appeal process. You should do that appeal process. And then you really need to keep a close eye on how you've been paying yourself. And uh, if you're an S-Corp, you should have been paying yourself as a W-2 employee. And the W-2 amount is what you paid into the uninsurance system. Uh, unemployment insurance system. And if that's the case, then yeah, I think that's wrong. Uh, definitely appeal. Okay, and this one from Catherine G. If you are a sole proprietor, can you write yourself a payroll check for $1,900 and then use that to pay for your rent expenses? 
Well, you can do that if you, if, if that's how much you earned and that's how much you paid yourself. So, um, you know, remember you go to line 31 times or uh, times 0.154. And if that number is a number, that's how much you get to pay yourself one way or the other. It doesn't matter what you use it for. It's just how much you get to pay yourself uh, because that's your payroll to you. Right. Um, so uh, I, I hope that answered the question. Okay. And this is from Gail M. Are property taxes included in the allowed, sorry, in the PPP? Um, no, um, nowhere that I have seen uh, are you allowed to pay taxes with the uh, allowable expenses of the PPP. Only interest on mortgage and rent when it comes to property. Okay, and this one from Alex MK. Uh, are, I am, am I eligible to apply for PPP if I have already received the EIDL payment? Absolutely. I encourage you to apply for both. Uh, now, let me rephrase and say, um, well, I don't need to rephrase. One way or the other, you're eligible to apply for both and receive both. They are not mutually exclusive. Okay. From Kate. I, I was going to say, Tom, I, I caught you off guard with a short answer. Yes, you did. Okay. From Kate B. I normally pay into the self-employed pension. Is it normal? Is a normal monthly set payment forgivable as a PPP expense as opposed to, as payroll? I'm gonna I'm gonna put a pin in that um, on on the the uh, self-employed pension uh, matters until I dig into it as part of this forgiveness uh, section. Um, and uh, uh, but I am uh, close to finishing an article on that. Double check uh, with ASMP.org. We're gonna blast it out. Um, going to be a really detailed post on forgiveness and I sense a lot of people have questions about that I want to make sure I address that okay from Lynn D can I use PPP to pay insurance but she doesn't specify what kind uh, so so no uh, is what I'm going with right now um, I'm going with a very a very strict reading of what are allowable uh, what are allowable forgivable expenses payroll costs interest on a mortgage, business rent, business utilities, and interest on business debts that are prior to February 15th, 2020. Those are the only ones that are listed and inside of payroll costs are a bunch of other things, but uh, I have not seen anyone give the green light to business insurance payments. And so I'm going to say right now until I hear otherwise that they're excluded. As, as always, Tom, we have a slew of questions still coming. Let's uh, keep going. I'm excited. Okay. <laughs> Scrolling back to where I was. Um, if This one from Stephen G. If eight, only eight weeks of PPP is forgivable, why did they give us 10 weeks of salary? Well, um, uh, here's where I want you to think that you are not in a business that's a sole proprietorship. You're in a business that has 20 employees, right? And if that's the case, then the, you would take your average payroll cost times uh, uh, 2.5 um, and you get that extra half a month of average payroll costs to put towards other things. And so if you're a sole proprietor, well, that makes, you know, it's real clear you have this extra money you have to spend somewhere else. But if you have 20 employees, you may use it to uh, pay other people because remember, you could hire a 21st employee and then instead of, of uh, you know, using the remainder half month on that, you use it to hire new people. Well, they want that to occur too. That's supportive of the economy, right? So um, it doesn't make a lot of sense if you're looking at it only as a sole proprietor. It makes a lot more sense if you're looking at it as a, uh, a business owner that has a number of employees. Quick aside on that, I read a great article about what if you're in a situation where your business rent is far greater than what you pay? Uh, the example was, uh, let's say you have a retail store in New York. Well, your rent is, is uh, uh, exponentially higher than your average monthly payroll cost. So the PPP didn't really help you too much because you weren't struggling with paying that, you were struggling with paying business rent 
And the PPP says you have to use 75% of it to pay payroll and not business rent. So this doesn't work for everyone. And that extra 0.5 of the month is uh, amount is there that helps kind of some different businesses. Okay, and this is, uh, this is coming through in a couple of different ways, and a couple of people have asked it a couple of different ways. So I'll just try to synthesize it. Gas, electric, water, phone, and internet. I count all these as utilities on my Schedule C. I own a studio building now. Are those uh, legitimate business expenses to be applied yeah. against the PPP? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I, uh, everything I've, I've seen indicates that those would be just fine um, uh, for, uh, you know, the, the question is, uh, the whole idea of was it eligible to be on a Schedule C as a deduction uh, for your business, then it's something that should be acceptable if it's a utility type thing. For okay. sure. and, and how about the home office, you know, if you're writing off part of your house as a home office, how does that factor in? Yeah, you know, that one's a little more on the edge. And I want, um, before I before I give an absolute rule on that, I'm going to ask one of the CPAs uh, about that, that I know. The reason being, you, I mean, you know, it's already so hard to take a deduction for a home office and do it legally. You don't, as long as it is actually a home office and you're using it exclusively for business, I don't see why it wouldn't be part of this, but I want to double check on that. Uh, I, I feel like it is, uh, if you can deduct it off your schedule C, then it should be a recognized business expense, but I want to double check on that. Okay. And this one is from Mike R. Please go over again, how EIDL and PPP interact. Isn't the 1000 EIDL a grant? And how, and right. So um, the, the EIDL, there's, I'm going to use the, the actual names for these. The EIDL, where they have already sent you some money between 1000 and 10,000, is the EIDL advance. Okay? It is an advance on a full EIDL loan. To my knowledge, those loans have not started to be generated yet, which means right now, everyone uh, who applied and who received that money has some amount of money um, that is, uh, if they get the loan, it's an advance on the loan and it rolls into the loan. If they don't get the loan or they don't accept the loan or a number of other things, then they do not have to pay it back. That's why people started calling it a grant. It, it, under no circumstances do you have to pay it back out of money when you, uh, with, your own, with your own money, right? And so how uh, does, I want to be really clear that the EIDL advance is different from the EIDL, even though they have the same letters in them, right? The EIDL is the official economic injury disaster loan and that is something the SBA grants through a lender and that kind of thing. I have not yet heard from anyone who's received that related to the pandemic. I don't know if that answered that completely, but I hope so. Okay, and here's one from Thomas D. I am very confused about the 850 seconds calculation that you were referring to earlier. It seems that it should be ultimately 100%, given that line 31 is my net income, which is the full amount I am dividing by 12 and multiplying by 2.50. So that yeah. my income would be two months of the income and then 0.5 months equals the other right. expenses. So, right. So what's right. So remember, what's happening there is that it's not about... Um, the way they're doing it is they're saying, if you're a sole proprietor, the only amount you're allowed to pay yourself is the equivalent weekly amount of what you paid yourself last year and what they're assuming you paid yourself last year is your net income, okay? So they're giving you an extra half month, but you don't get to, uh, what you're talking about, but the loan period, the forgiveness period is only eight weeks. So that's the number that you need to be looking at, not the 2.5, right? So if we're, again, if we're looking at the amount you made last year is, the, is for 52 weeks, right? Um, and 
and then you're dividing that by eight because that's the period of forgiveness, then that's the amount that you're going after. The extra amount is, again, an extra amount to use for other expenses, but that's the equivalent of what you were of what you paid yourself last year for eight weeks. Remember, it's eight weeks is the key. Okay, and this one from Tommy F. And it's speaking to what's, again, what's forgivable under the terms of the PPP program is if someone has a thousand dollars on a credit card prior to the pandemic, would the payments made toward that debt be considered forgivable? Would it have to be a credit card under the business name or could it be a personal card but was used for business expenses? So neither, uh, Tommy, and, and this is an important thing to note. It is interest on business debt, interest on business debt. And let me address the last one first and say, can it be a personal card that you put a business expense on? Almost always no, okay, almost always no. You really need to keep your business and personal stuff separate. You know, if this has taught us anything on the uh, business organization side, it's that, you know, Sole proprietors got a little bit screwed here. And it's a lot better if you were paying yourself a W-2 wage, you would, have, you would have been able to do a lot more here. And so I think that when we all get back on our feet a little bit, you should really think hard about forming that LLC, making things a little more formal because it's gonna protect you in more ways than one. And this was an unanticipated way. Getting back to your question, there is an argument that if the credit card is in your business's name and it you can then pay interest on it if you had the if the thing you're paying interest on was purchased prior to February 15th 2020 that number likely is not huge but that may be a forgivable expense i think it will be i'm not entirely sure under no circumstances can you pay the underlying amounts of your credit cards. It's only interest on business debt, not the underlying debt itself. Okay, and this one from Anise H. What happens if you got more money than you actually qualify for? I heard we were supposed to pay it back as of yesterday, but we just got our PPP loan this week and we'll not be talking to our accountant until next Monday. So the this is, you have to figure out why you got more money than you were anticipating. For example, there was a period of time before new guidance had come out that if you put in a PPP loan, you may have gotten more money than you would have had you applied after the new guidance came out. You don't have to return that. You applied under the rules in effect at the time you applied with all the guidance that you had at that moment. Um, I have not heard that you need to be repaying that amount. Now, if you didn't calculate it correctly, if someone didn't do something right, and therefore the amount is inflated, not because you were following the rules, but because just something was done incorrectly, you likely will have to pay some of that back. Um, I would wait to talk to the accountant. The day that um, you keep hearing about in terms of paying things back has actually been extended a week. It's uh, now May 14th. So I'll talk to your accountant and talk to your bank. And frankly, it's the bank's problem because the bank was the one that vetted your paperwork. And I know many people who submitted their paperwork to the bank in the number they thought they should have. Turns out that that wasn't actually the number. Uh, and so uh, the bank just redid it based on their evaluation of the paperwork. At the end of the day, it's your responsibility to make sure your numbers are right. But the difference is if you applied under the rules at the time correctly, then you should not have to pay that back. You, uh, you get the benefit of whatever the rules were at the time you applied. Okay, and this is from Judy ER. Do the utility bills need to be addressed to us at our business? I work from home, do not claim a home office, and only take utilities and phone, which are deductions on the Schedule C, can I take those bills even if not addressed to the business? Uh, no idea. 
Um, and I, I don't say that tongue in cheek. I say that in terms of, um, I don't know what you're going to need to prove there. Uh, look, it's easy to say if they're addressed to the business and it's a slam dunk. Yes. If they're not addressed to the business, you're going to have to prove that those bills are directly and only related to the business. If you can prove that, then, then maybe, but guidance may come out that says you have to have the business name on it. I, I really don't know. I expect that that question will be answered. Um, but again, don't go changing things today. It doesn't matter today. Almost everything is backdated. So you have to have had, had this done by February 15th of this year. Okay. This is from Tom, uh, Thomas K. We are in a partnership. Would the PPP apply to our partnership or as individual partners? Apply as a business or as individuals? Great question. And, and this is a great example of when guidance came out and was incredibly clear and it made me happy. You only apply on the part of the business, not you as individuals. Only on the part of the partnership, you submit one PPP application in the name of the business and not you as individuals. Good question. Okay, from JK. Our PPP came on a Wednesday. We had already submitted for unemployment for that week. Should we just take the seven days, seven weeks, sorry, plus three days of the payroll from the PPP? Um, uh, if, if that were the situation um, that I was encountering, I would call the unemployment office. Um, you're going to have to do that anyway. And I would ask them what they want to do. On the PPP side, remember, it's really just an in and out calculation. If you get this much money, you have to spend it this way. If you do, then it's forgiven. Uh, on the unemployment side, it's a lot more variable because it's not like PPP gets mad at you if you get unemployment. It's the other way around. Unemployment gets mad at you if you get PPP, right? So I would check with the unemployment office. They're going to have the answer to that. I don't, I don't think I have that. Okay, from Martha R., I did receive an EIDL advance. Can I still apply for PPP? Yep, absolutely. And you should. Okay. From Meg P, if you are a single LLC, does the owner compensation amount apply? If you, so LLCs can be taxed as sole proprietorships, or they can be taxed as partnerships, or they can be taxed as corporations. And you have to see how your LLC is taxed. Most single member LLCs are taxed as sole proprietors. If that is the case, then you would already generate a Schedule C. And if that's the case, then yes, you're exactly right. That's how you calculate the owner compensation amount. Okay, and this from Matthew L. In addition to the 0.154 formula, can I use the remainder on SEP IRA contributions based on 25% 2019 line 31 income two? Stick with me. Let me answer that. Um, <laughs> when I put together this article, I, I don't, I don't feel, I don't feel comfortable in saying that uh, for sure. Um, but I will make sure that you know exactly exactly what that is and all the SEP IRA issues uh, uh, shortly. Okay, I'm going to loop back to Thomas K's question. As a partnership, there is no payroll. We take draws when needed. How would that apply to us in using the 75%? Ah, so you have to think about, uh, remember, now you want to go to, um, and, and I'm not, I don't want to, you know, turn this into just promoting articles I write, but go to ASMP and look up, um, uh, you know, the how to calculate payroll article or how to calculate the amount for your PPP article. And it talks about what you need to do on partnerships and you have to look on the K1 and you have to do this other stuff. But the most important thing, if you're calculating a PPP amount is the money has to be payroll taxable, right? Um, now, with sole proprietors and independent contractors, they're saying the money that you paid taxes on in your net income 
is correct. It's likely going to be similar that the only money that you get to claim uh, as part of your PPP calculation in your partnership is your uh, is your net income that uh, is the on your 1023, which then filters down to the the various K ones. So double check that as double check that article. It's going to go through each step for you. But okay, uh, just a second. Uh, this is the two-parter from Stanley Yell. Can I deduct my home mortgage and expenses on top of the salary since I am a sole proprietor and the same with my health care? Um, I'm sorry, say that again, Tom. Says, can I deduct my home mortgage and expenses on top of the salary since I am a sole proprietor and then the same with my health care? So, no, you have to pay yourself and then that amount of money you can use to pay your personal living expenses. But you cannot directly pay from the PPP amounts, your home expenses or anything, even though you're sole proprietor. It sounds like a silly step, but do it anyway. Make a transfer to yourself and then pay out the amounts that are due. Uh, you got to keep good records here because uh, paying your home expenses is not a forgivable expense under the PPP. Okay, and this is from Barbara A. Are there any updates on the EIDL loans and when those might be coming? Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, every morning I wake up and, and check. And then, of course, yesterday I checked and it's agricultural only. Um, uh, my gut instinct is that that program will not open up again. Okay. Uh, I think that the EIDL advanced program is now closed. That does not mean the EIDL program is closed but uh, it's currently not accepting any applications right now. I think that will open up again, but that idea of that up to $10,000 advance, I, I am about 60% confident that that will not open up again and not get any more money either. Okay, and this is from Anise H. If your line 31 is more than $100,000, do you just cap at 100,000 and multiply by 0.154 or can it be the total amount? Um, it's not the total amount. I feel more confident now. My staff has been pinging me uh, in the last hour. Uh, you cap it at 100000 I feel very, very good about that, but that is something that could be subject to revisions and guidance. Uh, I would say cap it at 100000 That's going to be your ticket. Okay, and this is from Barbara A. If we get royalties once a month from a stock agency and are also getting PUA, how do we report it? Yeah, you would need to report that income to your unemployment office as earned wages because those royalties are occurring now. This is different from the situation where you did a job six months ago and you're only getting paid now. In that sense, I really want you to fight hard and appeal so that that isn't uh, a consideration. But let's say that you're working with a stock agency and you're, you know, every two, every two weeks you get some small check in, then that should be reported as uh, earned wages uh, in the week that you get it because that is active income. Okay, thank you. Uh, this one from Hanali L. As a sole proprietor, could I hire a contractor during the eight week period and pay them with PPP funds? No. So, um, uh, PPP funds are, can, it's payroll cost for your employees. It's not payroll cost for contractors. There's a few reasons, uh, why this is included in here, but no, I, that would not be a forgivable expense as far as I know. Okay, and this is circling back again to Barbara A's question. If we get royalties once a month from a stock agency and are also getting PUA, since the royalties are coming in at different times over the month, but included in uh, one payment, can I break it up and report it weekly as opposed to in one lump sum? That's going to be a question that your state unemployment office, there should be a huge section both on the website and otherwise that talk about reporting wages. 
Uh, different states do it differently. In Texas, you report every two weeks. Some states, it's every week, that kind of thing. Um, and so what you want to know there, my gut reaction says no. You get to report when you get a check. Um, but you may be able to talk with your standard employment office and say, hey, this is, you know, I get one check, but it covers these weeks. Can I break this up and see what they say? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, but that, that will have very clear guidelines because that's something that happens, you know, before the pandemic, you have to report income like that. Okay. And this is from Stan K. I have received my EIDL check of 1000 on 421. I then wrote a check to myself for $750. In the memo section, I listed it as April 2020 salary. Is that clear enough to indicate the amount of money was spent on my salary? And then there's a second part regarding an EIDL and PPP loan. Will this affect my receiving PUA assistance in the future? And if so, why? Um, okay. so. The EIDL advance that you wrote a check to yourself on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask that you definitely check in with an accountant or a tax advisor or someone on this piece of it. And the reason is there is a rule in there that when you accepted the EIDL, there's a box that you checked that said you wouldn't use that for uh, the same purposes as a PPP loan. Uh, which means payroll. And so you definitely want to account for this in a, in a way that, that makes sense. Now, if you didn't get a PPP loan, um, then I think paying yourself the 750 is no problem. If you did, you probably need to track that a little differently. Again, I don't think there's anything, there's no danger here or anything, but I do think that that's such a specific situation. You want to keep an eye on how it's tracked. I don't have any immediate good guidance um, for that other than keep an eye on that. Now, the second thing I would say is, uh, remember, PUA is affected by PPP, but every state's trying to figure out what to do with it. And some states are doing better than others at it. And some states just aren't doing anything at all. And uh, does it affect it? Yes, but how? It, it's there's no clear path. And that's one of the things that Tom and Mike and I are working on. There is, <laughs> we have a lot of questions left. So you're gonna have to signal me, Tom, when you feel like time is up and then we're gonna All have right. to figure out how to deal with the ones that remain. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll go to 4.30. Okay, uh, which I'm is sorry, uh, 5.30, 530 Eastern. Okay, do you need, this is from JB. Do you need to make the transfers from PPP savings account to business checking account in eight equal monthly payments, or can you transfer it in uneven amounts as long as it's all spent by the end of the eight weeks? My understanding is that you can spend it uh, however you want to, um, and it doesn't have to be equal amounts. Um, uh, you know, uh, what uh, just Personally, what I'm doing is that if I am using that money for one of the forgivable expenses, I transfer exactly what I need to pay with it, and then I pay that thing. And then if I need to do something else the next day, I would do that. And then I might not need to do something for a month, and then I would do it then. Those would all be different amounts. I'm not concerned about that. Okay, and this is from Kate B. Can the PPP loan cover normal payroll taxes, Social Security, et cetera? So... Um, uh, I actually do have this one up. Um, uh, give me one second here. Right there. All right. So, uh, I am looking at a document from Treasury and I will put the link in here. Um, and I will tell you what we can do here. Uh, payroll taxes, what's included in payroll costs? State and local taxes assessed on compensation, not employer paid federal income tax, or uh, federal taxes like Social Security. 
uh, in those taxes. Only state and local taxes that are uh, assessed on compensation. Okay, and this is from and Adam I'll put B. this link in here. Okay, sorry, Tom. This is from Adam B, but also some others have asked a similar question. I'm a sole proprietor and my 2020 income was a lot higher than 2019. Would that justify paying myself more to maximize the full PPP loan for paying myself? Unfortunately, no. Um, there are very, very clear right now that if you, you know, uh, your PPP amount was based on your 2019 Schedule C. The fact that this year is going a lot better, it doesn't matter. Your owner compensation amount is limited to line 31 times 850 seconds of, of uh, a year. So um, that's a tough situation. Also, no. Okay. This is from Joseph S. What is the 25% reduction time period based off of from forgive, for forgiveness rules? Okay. Um, and again, I'm going to get deep, deep into the weeds on this. Um, so there's two things. One is, you know, when you say 25%. And can I add a caveat that he just, uh, uh, or elaboration, I should say. Sure. He says, in other words, if you reduce the salary a month before PPP, is that new or lower salary the baseline or the old salary from January, for example? Uh, there's a clear answer to that, and it's actually a date, and I want to make sure I have my date right. Um, so, uh, for employees whose salaries or wages have been reduced between February 15th of this year and April 26th of this year, the reduced wages must be restored in full by June 30th of this year. Second, for employees whose salary or wages have been reduced during the eight week cover period, which is the forgiveness period we've been talking about, if you do that more than 25%, then it's a dollar for dollar exchange as to anything below 25% is non-forgivable. So to answer your question, if you had reduced someone's salary prior to February 15th, then that is the baseline. If you did it after February 15th, between February 15th and April 26th, then that is something that has to be repaid. There's some other tricky parts to this part of the calculation. And um, uh, the only reason I haven't gone into this a lot is it doesn't apply to a lot of SMP members or, or uh, sole proprietors, visual creators. Um, this is something I will have links to with more info, but a lot of my business clients have run into this. The answer to your question though is, if you did it between February 15th and April 26th, you have to restore that by June 30th. Before that, you don't have to. Okay, and this is from Bob H. Having just received my PPP on uh, May 6th, can I apply for my PUA and the Federal 600 for retroactive weeks not covered by the eight weeks, and then for time after the eight weeks elapses? I have not talked with every state about this, but I have talked with a few states about this. And the answer I have gotten 75% of the time has been yes. Uh, I talked with four people at four different state unemployment offices. Three of them said yes. One of them said no, but I'm not basing, I'm not saying that necessarily any of the four were right. But I believe that that is accurate interpretation that you were unemployed you can do that. The fact that you're employed now doesn't change the fact that you were unemployed then. And if you're eligible for those benefits, you should get those benefits. Okay, this is from Amy uh, S. I received the PPP and then I received the 1000 EIDL, even though I'm not planning on getting a loan through that program. They didn't deduct it from the amount I applied for from PPP. How does that how does this change what I do or don't need to pay back? All right. So um, here, and, and since we've now gotten a few, a few questions about this, um, uh, I will go ahead and, and uh, tell you exactly what, we, what they're saying here. Um, all right. Give me one 
one second. So the only thing I want you to think about with the PPP and the EIDL for now, and by the way, again, let me reiterate, we're still trying to figure out guidance on a lot of these interplays. And that's why you're seeing me go to my notes uh, more often than the PPP calculations are easy. The forgiveness stuff is, is what we're dealing with now. Um, if you have a loan, uh, you, you are, you're not thinking about taking the loan. The one thing I do want you to be aware of is the definition of what you can use the EIDL money for is pretty much anything. Remember the PPP money you have to use for very specific things. You can use the EIDL money for anything, but not the same thing. Okay. I know this sounds a little, little sticky. Um, if you are eligible for both of them and you get both of them, you can use both of them and use the funds at the same time as long as you don't use them for the same purpose. Okay. Make sense? I hope so. I may, okay. I may clear that up a little more in the future. Okay, here's another one. If you're a sub S, can you apply for an additional PPP if you only put in your salary and didn't know to add in health insurance and retirement? No. Um, I, no, and the reason I say no is because if you've already applied for the PPP and gotten funded, and now you realize you did the calculation wrong, what that means is your EIN or, or your uh, 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 TIN or SSN has already been approved by the SBA. And if they see another application with that number, it's going to automatically reject it. Um, the best I can say is maybe call your bank. Uh, and call your bank or lender and tell them that and see what advice they have. But um, I would not just reapply again. I think that's, that's probably a, not the right move. Probably. Okay. And this one from John K. Wells Fargo is close to dispersing my loan. I didn't run payroll for March and April and was planning to use the PPP loan to back pay my salary to maintain my monthly, average monthly salary based on 2019. I'm an LLC taxed as a C-Corp. I spoke with my CPA and because of the structure, it seems fine to do so. What are the rules for single member LLC and I'm running my own W-2 salary? And I'm sorry, Tom, if you could just read the first part again. Wells Fargo was close to dispersing my loan. I didn't run payroll for March and April and was planning to use the PPP loan to back pay my salary to maintain my average monthly salary based on 2019? No, you can't back pay your salary. Uh, even, if you, even if you weren't able to pay yourself the last two months, you're not able to use the proceeds of the PPP to pay yourself from behind. You can only use it for the pay periods that are during the covered period, the forgiveness period of eight weeks. Okay, this one from Catherine F. Does PPP for sole proprietor utilizing it for self payroll and utility rent expenses negate PUA assistance only for that it period or, or, or totally? Correct. Uh, only for that period yeah. because it is perfectly reasonable that you could get a PPP loan the eight weeks ends and you still don't have any work. And if that's the case, then you're still unemployed. Okay. And this one from JB. The language you use can use for PPP for group health care insurance. Does this include my private Blue Cross Blue Shield of Texas insurance? That's my only insur health insurance and deducted on my IRS 1040. So likely not, um, because that sounds like insurance that you have entered into under your personal name, not insurance that has been acquired by your business and then issued to you as an employee. The difference, even though the money's all coming from the same place, the difference is that you can pay employer side health benefits as part of payroll costs, but you can't do it as the individual employee. Okay, so we are now at the 530 magic hour. 
but still a number of questions to go. One last thing Gabriella M is asking is, is it possible to share all the URLs from today's broadcast on one slide? And I, or sure. one place. Sure. Uh, that's a great question, Gabriella. I will, uh, I will see what we can do about that. And when this video goes up at the ASMP website in the COVID-19 hub, uh, we will make sure that there is some information next to it on where you can get those links. And we will track all the other questions that we're not able to get to this afternoon. And once again, as always, I want to thank Mike and Tom and the tech team behind this town hall for their work today. Uh, I know that these town halls are provoking more questions, as many questions as they are providing answers. So I wanted to give each of you one last bite at the apple to say anything remaining, and then we'll close it out. Mike, Tom? I guess all I'll say is it'll be very interesting what happens over the next couple of weeks with the House coming back and the Senate turning its attention to this. Right now, the House is working to come up with an agreement among the Democrats which is going to include a, purportedly a strong state aid provision, so be, and which is fought very strongly by you know, many Republicans. The other question is, at what point will McConnell, who has threatened to do so, say we've incurred enough debt and put up the stop sign from his perspective? So hopefully next week we'll have more to report. It was a quiet week as far as what they're you know doing. It's behind closed doors, but. The next 10 days, I suspect, we'll be learning more about if there will be another round of stimulus bill. And I will say that because we not only are, we're advocating on, on uh, the financial relief packages, but also advocating on the CASE Act, now is a great time to join and uh, use our P2A tool on the website to write in to your senators who are not currently co-sponsors to ask them to co-sponsor the legislation. And obviously, since Senator Ron Wyden is the lone holdout, to continue to write him to tell him that it's time to lift this hold, that we, you know, we need the passage of this bill and it's as important to getting relief as some of the other things that are going on right now. Tom, uh, any, anything else? To yeah, add? I absolutely agree with that. Here's, here's where I'm going to wrap up. Uh, there were hundreds of you here today, and I would love uh, if uh, each of you went out and got someone to come to next week's town hall. I think that, and I don't, we've had realtors here. We've had uh, small business owners here that have nothing to do with photography. And I think that's so great for uh, that. We're just getting information out to everyone. Bring everyone you know. If you're not a member of ASMP, we'd love to have you as a member. It strengthens everything we do. It allows us to do this programming. Please, we'd love to have you. If membership isn't in the cards right now, this is an incredibly tough time. We understand any, uh, any way you can support ASMP National at bit.ly slash ASMP dash support is beneficial. We're so happy to do this for y'all and uh, thank you again for coming and we'll see you next week. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, Mike. And thank you, tech team. And thank you, we'll, tech. See you we'll see you hopefully Wednesday for Tom's next uh, Wednesday webinar regarding yeah, health and safety issues. We've got to have everybody there for that. And then again, for next week's town hall, everyone stay safe and have a great weekend.